Okay, so here is our lecture on the 30 Years War. It's just a short one today uh, because of our upcoming midterm. So we're going to make it short and sweet. And this is just going to wrap up our wars of religion, Protestant Reformation, fun stuff there. Okay, here we go. Okay, so before we get into the war itself, let's talk a tiny bit about um, just some of the background, culturally speaking, uh, that you'll find in the Protestant Reformation during the 1600s. There's an effort uh, right across Europe to try to create a visual and aesthetic distinction uh, between Catholic and Protestant groups. And one of the ways you can see this play out is in art and architecture. Um, the debate between Protestants and Catholics uh, rage around many ideas, but one of the ideas that is focused on very often, uh, Protestants critique Catholics and they, they claim that the Catholic Church had become corrupted, that it had turned away from dedication to spirituality and religiosity, and instead was focused on luxury and enjoying themselves and this kind of exploration of physical pleasures and away from uh, the, tr the traditional spiritual things that were important. They also emphasized the importance of scripture as the one authority that you trust. So whether you're a Calvinist or a Lutheran or anybody else, the idea of scripture was given first and foremost, its precedence and being the one thing that we care about. And so you can see this play out in new decorative styles. Uh, Protestant churches, especially Puritan Protestant churches, are going to embrace plainness and simplicity. They're going to get rid of a lot of, a lot of the images that you find inside Catholic churches at this time and instead focus on creating a more studious, a more serious, a less phys uh, physiologically pleasurable environment and instead one that is focused on spiritual purity reflected in uh, aesthetic purity, if you will. So with the, there's still very beautiful churches, but the Oudekerk here, for instance, in Amsterdam, you can see very plain lines, everything very squared off, everything very unadorned uh, compared to Catholic churches of the day. Catholics, in contrast, are going to double down. They're going to start putting decorations on their decorations. Uh, musically and artistically, this period is sometimes referred to as the Baroque, uh, where they are just putting a, a sort of very lavish, over-the-top emphasis on what they traditionally had done. Not only are they going to refuse to give up the use of imagery inside churches, they're going to justify it by claiming that including things like pictures of angels and saints and God and, and the devil and everything else, that this is meant to not only provide practical instruction for people who might not be able to read, which the Catholics absolutely did not think you had to do in order to be a good Christian, uh, but it also was meant to elevate somebody's senses to the point where they felt uh, surrounded by something beyond the world, something that was sublime was the word that they used. So all of this was meant to give people a sense that there was more than just earthly things. And that was what it was all about. So the Catholics are going to emphasize this, they're going to double down on it, and they're going to really actively reach out to people who don't find the more austere uh, Protestant sensibility appealing by going way over the top. So they start decorating their decorations, it goes way, way, way further than they ever had before. They start emphasizing stories of the saints. It, it really just goes, it's very popular, but it, uh, it goes way uh, into overboard. Okay. So now let's talk about the last, one of the last great wars of religion. Now, up until this point, we've already talked about how uh, the Holy Roman Emperor fights with German principalities, uh, you know, where Luther, uh, backed by the Duke of Saxony, is going to get in trouble with the church. And so there's all that fighting. And so Charles V has to sign in 1555 the Peace of Augsburg, where he comes to a temporary compromise, saying that whoever's kingdom it is, they can choose the religion. Uh, we also talked about the French Wars of Religion, where there was a, uh, a serious about for 20 years of sectarian violence between uh, Protestants and Catholics fighting in France. We've talked about all of that in the past, but this uh, conflict in 1618 is when it begins, is going to be arguably the worst and ultimately the last of the great wars of religion in Europe. 
what happens is this. I'll give you the fast version as much as I can. The, in 1618, um, the region of uh, what is now the Czech Republic, uh, it was called Bohemia at the time. The region of Bohemia had been ruled by a relatively liberal um, duke who, or prince, I guess you could more accurately say, who more or less let people uh, decide what they wanted to do for their own religion. He wasn't very strict on whether they had to be Protestant or Catholic, didn't really care. And so he let them do their own thing for years after 1555 Peace of Augsburg. In 1618, though, there was a power shakeup and a more conservative ruler took over. And he was not keen on this whole idea of Calvinists and Lutherans being able to like have their own churches and do their own thing. And in Prague, which is uh, in now in the Czech Republic, there were a number of Protestant churches under construction. There had been a fire. It was a long story. Uh, but there were a number of Protestant churches under construction. And when this more conservative Catholic leader came to power, he halted construction. He's like, we're not having those churches in my territory. Forget it. Uh, and the Protestant leaders of the town government, many of whom were very important and highly placed, were very angry about this. And they demanded a meeting with the Catholic deputies of the Holy Roman Emperor. And at this meeting, they demanded an answer. What is the Holy Roman Emperor going to do? Is he going to... Uh, follow along with the general practice for 50 years of letting people kind of do their own thing with religion? Is he not going to? What's going on? The deputies try to dither. They're like, well, we'll just, we'll call, we'll write letters. We'll find out. We'll get back to you. And the, um, people who'd assembled were furious at this. They were so angry. They're like, no, we, we want an answer about our community right now. And when they didn't get it, they grabbed up the Catholic deputies of the Holy Roman Emperor and threw them out the window. Defenestration is just a $10 word for throwing somebody out the window. And in 1618, uh, three Catholic deputies get chucked out a window on the third floor. So they were about 60, 70 feet up. They get chucked out a window. They don't die by interesting intervention, uh, as it just so happens. They don't die, but they are thrown out the window. And this, to the Holy Roman Emperor, is an act of war. He's not putting up with this uppityness. He is not going to tolerate this from Protestants inside his empire. And so he calls in the army. Okay, so we've said this kind of thing before, and we're going to continue talking about it every time we talk about a new political conflict in this class till the end of the semester. Every time we get to another one of these major wars, the technology, technique, and logistics of warfare have changed. They've moved forward. And in 1618, that is true. Uh, armies were larger than ever. They were more heavily based on infantry or common people fighting on foot than they ever had been before. There's heavier use of gunpowder weapons than ever before, uh, particularly in cannons and other types of artillery. Um, and these huge new armies are going to be fielded during the Thirty Years' War. The Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand II, is going to call in the army. He's going to gather up the fiercest fighters that he can get hold of, and he is going to launch them uh, at the rebels in uh, Central Europe particularly those in what is now the Czech Republic, where there was a strong nationalist movement as well. The motives for the Thirty Years' War are complicated and tangled. Some people are in this about the religious issue. Many people are in this for uh, political independence. Some people are using it as uh, kind of both. Some of it are just in it for personal motives. In 1620, uh, there's going to be a decisive battle at, at White Mountain, or fairly decisive battle. It was a, a really vicious battle at White Mountain in 1620, where Czech rebels are going to confront the forces of the Holy Roman Emperor. He's going to crush them and uh, begin rolling back any compromise or toleration in his territory. This backfires in the sense that many regions, which were more or less obedient to the Holy Roman Emperor, decide that they will not be from here on out. Some of them are motivated by religious concerns. They're afraid that he is going to stop them from being Protestant. Some of them are motivated by purely by politics. And some of them, as I say, are motivated by personal reasons. But there is going to be a massive empire-wide uprising of people who are going to stand up against Ferdinand. He doesn't hold back. He grabs the most vicious, absolutely brutal military commander he can and puts him in charge. This guy, 
Albrecht von Wallenstein. Wallenstein is himself a Protestant, but he's willing to work for the highest bidder, so he's hired by the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand. And then he's put in charge of this massive, newfangled, um, modernized army, and he goes uh, all out to try to suppress this rebellion. And it's a messy, messy conflict. It's a rebellion, which is essentially a civil war. And so Wallenstein is going from town to town with this giant army, doing his best to suppress popular feeling, to suppress popular resistance. And that means he is in very substantive way is going to launch himself at civilian populations as well as at assembled soldiers who rise up to fight against him. He's brutal about it. We'll talk about some of the, de the details and tactics a little bit later on, but he's brutal about it and he causes so much devastation and he targets people who are Protestant in particular, whether they're fighting or not. And it's such a bloodbath and such a horrible a display that Gustavus Adolphus, the king of Sweden, decides he wants to get involved. We haven't really talked about the King of Sweden up until this point, or Sweden in general, because up until now, it's really kind of operated on the fringes of European politics in a broad sense. They've always been there as trade partners, etc. But what's happened under Gustavus Adolphus is that he has made a ton of effort and spent a ton of money modernizing his armies in particular, but his country in general, with a view to making them more closely related and connected to Europe economically and politically. And he has, he himself is a Protestant, and he sees himself as the ally of Protestant principalities in Central Europe, places like Bohemia, places like Saxony, Brandenburg, places like that. And so when he sees these regions, uh, his allies and his co-religionists under attack, he takes his enormous army. Now, Sweden doesn't have a big population compared to France, for instance, or the Holy Roman Empire, but because of Gustavus Adolphus's uh, behavior, they have a huge army. It's as big as the army of France. So, so he's going to take them to the south. He's going to invade continental Europe and go after Wallenstein and the Holy Roman Emperor's forces. And they're going to turn into this massive, huge scale war. And everybody in Europe, one way or another, is going to be pulled into it economically, if not uh, directly. And it ends up being warfare on a scale that had never been seen in Europe before this point. Armies, uh, individual battalions, armies uh, that were on any given field at a time, uh, number in the tens of thousands. Altogether, you have troop numbers well into the hundreds of thousands operating uh, kind of simultaneously. It was going to be massively devastating. We'll talk about that in just a second. Before we get into the outcome of some of these battles, let's talk a little bit about some of the political situation that was the backdrop to the Thirty Years' War. France is struggling. Uh, they've had problems since 1610, eight years before the defenestration of Prague, because Henry of Navarre, remember him, with the Edict of Nantes, toleration, he's been assassinated. And his son was just young, Louis XIII, when he takes over. Richelieu is going to be the chief advisor to Louis XIII, and he is going to have to play a very careful game. France is not very stable. It's a little bit in disorder. It's not clear what's going to happen. And so Richelieu is going to try to kind of split the difference. He doesn't want... Uh, to straight up empower Protestants. But at the same time, France has no real desire to see the Holy Roman Emperor win this. Because the Holy Roman Emperor, a member of the Habsburg family in Eastern Europe, is backed by Philip IV of Spain, who is another member of another branch of the Habsburg family. And between the two of them, they have France caught in this kind of sandwich in the middle. And so even though uh, Richelieu is a cardinal, even though France is Catholic, even though they have no desire to be anything but Catholic, uh, Richelieu does not want the Catholics to win in this war of religion. And so what he's going to do is they're going to event, they're going to drag their feet and provide help to uh, Protestants here and there under the table until eventually they are pushed to it because it looks like the King of Spain is making uh, some inroads in the Netherlands. 
And when it looks like Spain is going to get the upper hand, France is going to declare for uh, their neighbors, the Swedes, the Dutch, and the, the, the um, I'm sorry, the general Protestants that live in Central Europe. And so even though they're Catholic, they're going to back the Protestants and they're going to sort of tip the tide and balance things out once again. Spain is going to have a major problem as a result of this. Remember I promised you, I, I might have mentioned it a class or two ago, uh, where we talked about how in 1492, when the Alhambra Decree uh, banishes uh, the leaders of Jewish banks out of Spain, how they were going to pay because they've just kicked out everyone who understands macroeconomics. Well, here you go. Ready? This is the simplified version. Spain has been very busy since 1492, conquering and enslaving and generally um, looting um, the Americas, the Western Hemisphere. And so they are literally grabbing up gold and silver, mining it in some cases and stealing it in others and importing it directly into Spain. The problem is this, is that they are literally importing money. And when you do that, if you just put that money into circulation, if you just print more coins, which is what they're doing, uh, you lower the value of your currency. And when the value of the currency starts to go down, well, then it takes more money to buy goods. And so the price of everything goes up and there's massive inflation. And Spain panics about this because they don't understand macroeconomics. And they decide the answer to this, brace yourselves for this piece of genius. The answer to this is to prevent Spanish merchants and producers, whether it's uh, of agricultural products, textiles, uh, luxury goods, whatever it is prevent them from exporting anything to other countries. The thought process being that if those goods remain in Spain, then the cost of the goods will go down because there will be a surplus because Spain wasn't able to export them. Yeah, that's not how any of this works. Instead, what Spain ends up with is an absolutely hamstrung economy where their producers can't make any money their merchants can't make any money the money in circulation is has less and less value it's just a disaster and then they have one setback after another they lose that spanish armada thing in 1588 then they get involved in the, in the 30 years war and things start going badly and it all costs such a fortune that eventually it just falls apart. The economy of Spain collapses. Their currency is worthless. Everything goes right to pot. There you go. Okay, so that brings us to Richelieu. He, as we mentioned in our reading discussion last time, is the advisor to Louis XIII, and he very much follows a policy of absolutist monarchy. He wants to see the king have all of the authority, all of the power, to the extent that it's possible in, um, in the government of France. And he's got an uphill battle to try to make that happen. And he's willing to do what it takes. Richelieu, uh, very famously or infamously, he's so uh, he's considered such a villain uh, by people more or less of his own day that if you've read The Three Musketeers or any of those books at that time, uh, The Man in the Iron Mask, Richelieu is the villain in that piece. At any rate... Um, he's going to institute things like spy service, secret police, that kind of thing. He also is going to take steps to brutally repress Protestants um, in France. Anytime it looks like there's going to be some tolerance, all of those rules of the law, the Edict of Nantes that was passed to provide people the right to make their own decision according to their own conscience, he erases that, he rolls it back and destroys it. Um, and he takes advantage of this time of upheaval and warfare to call Protestants uh, traitors, round up uh, the forces of France against them and crush them. At the same time, because he's a Machiavellian, remember, after all, he's always going to do whatever is most practical. He's going to have France join the Thirty Years' War, not against Protestants, but on the same side as Protestants. He's going to side with the Germans, Czechs, Swedes, and Dutch against Catholic Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, because it really wouldn't be in France's best interest to be surrounded by powerful neighbors on each side that are Catholic. He doesn't care who's Catholic. He's like, it's important for France to be important. That's the one thing I care about. 
So the war itself was a messy business. It was brutal and awful. The armies, as I mentioned before, were larger than ever before. And this not only means more deaths on the battlefield, because we're talking about lightly armored people or unarmored people fighting with pikes, in some case gunpowder weapons, uh, but they're fighting against people with cannons and that sort of thing. Uh, there is going to be some cavalry involved as well, or always is to some degree. But the great majority of people are fighting on foot, not a lot of armor, not a lot of advanced or sophisticated weapons. And there's going to be a lot of death in, as a result of that. But even worse, there's going to be a great deal of death as a result of disease and hardship and exposure and just general being unprepared. Having that many people on the march uh, creates logistical nightmares that nobody was adequately prepared for. Uh, as they fight. Uh, they can't, they constantly, armies are constantly being cut off from their baggage train. They're constantly being cut off from their supply lines. They can't gather enough food. They can't buy enough food to keep the armies fed. And so uh, they result, they resort to looting. They resort to generally uh, stealing everything they could possibly want from the local population. And that even doesn't go that well. We'll talk about that in just a second, because you have multiple armies moving around the same region in Central Europe. Most of the fighting is going to take place in the Holy Roman Empire and its surrounding principalities. Um, and because you have lots of these huge armies battling it out in this area, you have a lot of people competing for the same resources. On top of that, there is absolutely no effort to hold back from uh, attacks and brutalization of the common and local people. This is a civil war from the perspective of the Holy Roman Emperor and how he's going to get the people in, say, Bohemia or in Brandenburg or in Saxony to obey him is by terrorizing them until they surrender. That's the goal. And so it is going to get enormously, horribly nasty. Um, the, there's also not a germ theory of disease and not a real clear idea about how to organize your military camp so you're not polluting your own water supply. As a result, disease is going to run rampant. There are going to be a number of various uh, pandemics, epidemics, pandemics that go through the armies and everyone they come into contact with. Cholera, which is a disease of polluted water. Typhus, same deal. Dysentery, ditto. As well as scarlet fever. Um, basic forms of, well, every kind of disease you can imagine. But influenza, everything, and kind of contagious disease goes everywhere. And then all of the diseases of dirty water, like cholera and typhus, end up killing people in the first thousands, then hundreds of thousands, then ultimately it's going to be even worse than that because it's not just the soldiers and combatants that die. The great majority of people who are going to die in the 30 years war are civilians. And the great majority of civilians who die are going to die of starvation and disease. Um, and this is a situation that is not just accidental. As armies travel through a town or a village, they're going to steal everything that isn't nailed down. They're going to terrorize anybody that tries to resist them. They're going to terrorize people who aren't even trying to resist them. Because again, the goal is to uh, force the countryside to surrender, to not resist anymore if you're the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, on the flip side, they're not going to be treated any better uh, by the armies of Sweden or anybody else who's also stealing everything they own to supply the army, but then also to prevent the enemy from getting hold of it. And so if you were, say, living in a village that had a nice field of crops, for example, uh, the first army that came to your town is going to steal everything that is worth eating. They're going to steal your grain supply. They're going to steal your cow. They're going to steal whatever it is that you have that is worth having. And then if your wheat is still growing in the field and it's not ready for harvest, they'll burn it down because they don't want the army that's going to come along after them to be able to access it. So if you're a farmer that's living in this town, you're enormously vulnerable. You're a sitting duck because that's what it means to be a farmer. You plant, you invest, and then you wait and you harvest. And you can't do that because people are coming through and destroying everything, wrecking everybody up, killing everybody. It is just horrifying. And so you have waves of people who end up as refugees, who flee their homes, searching for some kind of uh, safety, searching for some kind of security. After their places have been burned, sometimes ahead of being burned, they're running off into the hills to hide, and then they end up displaced, homeless, starving. Uh, it is 
death and destruction on a level Europe had never seen before. Uh, estimates vary on exactly how many people die as a result, direct result of the Thirty Years' War, but it is probably between five and eight million at the end when you add up the death toll. And this is five and eight million, five to eight million between 1618 and 1648. The world population isn't what it is now, wasn't wasn't then what it is now. Uh, this was a massive chunk of the population. And for that reason, uh, the end of the Thirty Years' War is in a sense almost an end of an era. Now we've introduced a new kind of warfare, a total warfare, a warfare that afflicts the, the peasant population as much or more. Not that it never didn't affect them before at all, but it, it is not at all. It's complete departure from what we would have found in medieval warfare. This is the kind of warfare that is going to reshape how people think about war in Europe. Uh, and so the Peace of Westphalia ends up being reflective of that. It's a peace treaty that was going to be signed in a rather novel way. Up until this point in Europe, when various countries got into battles with each other, it's not that uncommon to have many people involved in a conflict. When they got into battles, however, when they decided to come to a conclusion and sue for peace, they kept their treaties secret as much as they could. And they did that for political reasons, because they didn't want to admit to their allies or to their own people what concessions they'd made in order to get out of this conflict. So they'd be able to go home and announce to everybody, congratulations, the war is over, we got this slice of land or the right to trade here or whatever it is we got. And then they won't admit to whatever it is they gave up. They did this even with their own allies. They would sign a separate peace treaty and they wouldn't admit to what exactly the deal was. At the Peace of Westphalia, they don't do that. This is going to be a public peace treaty witnessed by everyone involved. You can see the painting there. Witnessed by everyone involved and practically everyone was involved in the battles uh, in the Thirty Years' War uh, in order to prevent war from breaking out in the future. Now, this is a radical new outlook on war. Up until this point, government, kings, rulers looked at war as a tool. This is something they could use occasionally to enrich themselves and their people, maybe get an advantage out of it. It's something not to really worry about or be too concerned about what having to face. The Thirty Years' War changes people's attitude. It was so destructive. It was so devastating. It left the, the economy of Europe in such a shambles. There were food shortages, starvation, disease, so many people dead, and then so many people who survived suffering uh, because they can't afford enough food to eat. I mean, Central Europe was a mess, but even outside Central Europe, if you were in France or Spain or England, there's no surpluses to buy. If you live in a city, uh, being able to buy enough grain to uh, support your family becomes enormously challenging because the supplies are so low, the price is so high, everything is hard. It, and people are really struggling as a result of this. Even if they weren't directly affected, the war damaged everyone. And that was a epic changing revelation to a lot of people in Europe to have come out of a war and said, be able to say there was no winner. And there really was no winner in the Thirty Years' War. It didn't change much uh, by the end. There was nobody clearly with the upper hand. And so it was simply 30-year horrible, horrible conflict that just damaged everyone. And so the purpose of the Peace of Westphalia was deliberately to prevent war from breaking out in the future. And one of the ways they tried to do that was by having everyone know what the terms of the treaty was and everyone act as guarantor so that if somebody broke the treaty, everybody else would pile on in order to enforce the terms. That was the idea. Now, I'm sure you all know it doesn't work. Uh, there's going to be more war in Europe, and every one of those wars just gets worse than the last every time. But even so, you can see this as a march toward modern warfare in that it is a, it's an example of total war and an example of an awareness of war as like a natural disaster. 
Okay, so other things to note, uh, Louis the 13th is going to die in 1643. Richelieu died the year before, and that leaves a great amount of instability in France. Louis the 14th is five years old when he inherits the throne. And there's he inherits the throne at a time when there's food shortages, when there's uh, political disruption, there's all kinds of a mess. And then finally, uh, the map of Europe is going to be transformed as well. If you see that pale blue, the crown of Bohemia, Austria, Hungary, this, these are lands that are owned outright, controlled outright by the Holy Roman Emperor. He's no longer going to call it the Holy Roman Empire, though from here on out, we're going to call it the Austrian Empire for the most part. Um, and these are territories controlled by the Habsburgs. All of that stuff to the north and west though that kind of like pink mishmash of green and you know just all those little bitty pieces that are stuck in there where germany is and some of poland too uh, but all of that uh, is collectively referred to as the german principalities they'd more or less run their own show since 1555 but after the 30 years war it's basically official the holy roman empire doesn't exist anymore and those german independent principalities are independent and so, and the Dutch as well. The Netherlands is gone to Spain. Spain will never have it. That is it. And they, Spain is more or less going to give it up after this point. And so Spain is going to be diminished. They're going to lose even more of their control over politics in Europe. That's going to keep the door even wider open for places like England, who just so happen to not really fight in the Thirty Years' War. And so their path is clear in a way it hadn't been in the past. France is not as uh, damaged as other places, and they're going to scramble for uh, some control again. But most important is this mess in Central Europe, those German principalities. They're independent, which is good if you were the ruler of, say, Saxony. But the downside is that each of them is independent and they're self-governing and they're not united into one nation in any way. And so that is going to, in the long run, be a bit of a disadvantage. These German principalities, as they're all independent, are not going to be able to take part in some of the political maneuvering and changes and developments that are going to come the next 200 years in Europe. And so when they finally do coalesce into Germany, this is foreshadowing a bit, it's going to take 200 years before that happens. When they finally coalesce into Germany, they're going to have to play catch up really fast. Because as it stands right now, uh, they're not going to be able to take part in grabbing up land around the world, creating colonial empires, that kind of thing. So we'll talk about all of that uh, in the future next time. Thanks a lot. That's it for now.